I'm here at Velocity Conference 2014 with DevOps consultant J. Paul Reed. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. You've talked recently about linguistic structures for post-mortem analysis. What does that mean, and how do those structures aid in the discussion? Well, so a lot of the research that's been done on post-mortems and, and how uh, to create, you know, positive, productive, and actionable postmortems. Um, focuses on sort of the language that we use and the structure in which that sort of postmortem takes place. Mm -hmm. And so one of the interesting things that um, when I was doing a lot of the research on this and talking with, uh, you know, clients and people about how do they do their postmortems is even though uh, we are all software engineers, right, uh, and when we have a very engineering mindset, a lot of times if you sit back and watch a postmortem, you'll see that uh, there's not a distinction between the fact-finding part and the judgment part. Uh, and the, the judgment part, of course, goes into this whole blendless postmortem concept as well. But a lot of times you'll see people actually debating a point, and one person is talking about, did you do the right thing or not, the judgment part. And the other people are just trying to actually figure out what happened. That, that's where they are in that phase. So understanding you know, and separating out sort of the, the finding of fact and the finding of judgment uh, from a linguistic standpoint, like are we talking about facts or are we talking about analysis, the judgment part, is actually really important and being sort of cognited, uh, or cognizant about that process is part of it. Um, the other thing that we you know, uh, found out in the, in the research, uh, you know, the, the uh, researchers that, that you know, study aviation and nuclear power plants and accidents and postmortems there, um, this idea of human error, right? When we talk about human error, um, a lot of the work they're doing is actually redefining those terms. Um, the, this idea of root cause, that's very, you know, root cause analysis was a very big thing. And, and we throw those terms around a lot. Um, and a lot of the research that they've done kind of says, in certain cases, you know, human error is actually something different than we all think it is. Um, it's, it's not uh, an actual explanation that is, is useful to solving that problem in that case. A root cause analysis, uh, a lot of that, the research there is pointing to, like, there is no root cause. That's actually not even a concept that is useful to talk about. But if you listen to a lot of the postmortems, certainly ones that I've been in, people throw around, I want you to find the root cause, and then I want you to, you know, find out who's responsible, right? And when you're in the middle of a postmortem discussion, the it's not just the language. With the humans involved, there's also a bias that's brought to the table. Yes. So what are some of these cognitive biases, yeah. and, and how, how are they best handled? So it's funny. Uh, psychologists uh, have done a ton of research on, you know, um, and, and sociologists have done a ton of research on bias in the human brain and in, in, in sociological interactions, and, and we're just, it's just the way we're wired. Um, and so if you go and look on Wikipedia for like all of the types of, of bias that humans are susceptible to, you'll see a, a ton of them. Uh, and there's some really interesting, fascinating experiments that they've done where they can actually prove this and show this. Um, the three that, that I talked about that come up really often uh, in a postmortem context is uh, hindsight bias. And you, you can detect hindsight bias uh, when somebody says, well, they should have known, or why didn't you do that? And it's, it's this uh, theory that when we know what happened, when we know that the site went down, then it's easy to go back and look, well, well why didn't they look at that metric before they pushed the change? Or why didn't they look at the database you know, uh, load averages or whatever, right? Why didn't they look at this? And that's a hindsight bias. Those are questions uh, that we wouldn't ask if the, the deployment had gone fine. Um, uh, the, uh, they call it the ugly uh, stepsister of hindsight bias is outcome bias. Um, and that's the bias that, you know, uh, when practitioners in the space, you know, uh, ops engineers are doing their work, they may make trade-offs all the time. And th some of them may be even subconscious trade-offs about, you know, time, cost, money, you know, all, all of that kind of stuff to be successful. Um, when they make those trade-offs, Maybe they might make a trade-off that the business or their manager would find frightening, but no one would question it if the deployment went, went fine, right? And so we, it's only that we question those things because the outcome was bad. And the interesting one about outcome bias is that, you know, there's this concept of uh, the difference between uh, work as conceived and as practiced. So what we think all the ops engineers are doing and what they're actually doing. Um, and that's where you see this outcome bias coming up. Um, and the other one uh, is, is called correspondence bias. 
Um, and this is really uh, the problem that DevOps uh, was meant to solve. It's this idea that uh, you know, if I see somebody else doing something, and uh, the, the example they always give is I'm at a red light in my car, and uh, the light turns green, and then this car just comes screaming by me. And I might think to myself, well, what is wrong with that person? They're obviously not safe, like they're not paying attention, they must be a horrible driver. But that's in my little world, in my car. Maybe they have uh, you know, someone about to give birth at the back, right? Or, or something like that. They're on the way to the hospital. Um, you see this a lot like in DevOps, where the developer's like, those ops people, those ops people always screwing everything up, right? And, and similarly on the ops side, they're like, oh, there's developers, they're just writing all this code, it's all this bug, all, you know, all, the, all these bugs in it. Um, so that, that's an example of you know, um, our own little world space can sometimes color um, the way we perceive uh, what might have happened in a, a particular incident. And so when a, a company is planning to set up a post-mortem analysis, are there some structures, some models they can, they can follow to ensure a productive discussion? Yeah, so, <laughs> um, yeah, uh, one of the big things that, that uh, they can do, and it depends, you know, a, a lot of the issues that, that you, you run into with post-mortems, I think the current structure most companies do is they get everybody in a room and they sort of go over what happened and then maybe they come up with some remediation steps. That's the pretty common model. Um, you look at, and it's always a sliding scale, like how much do you actually want to invest? Like if you, if you have a particularly bad site outage, they start talking about, you may actually want to debrief people alone. And, and a, a cheap way to do that is actually, before the postmortem where we all get together, I want everybody to email someone you know, who's coordinating what they thought happened. And it's actually fascinating. We did a postmortem workshop uh, a, a few months ago where we did a, a fake incident, right? And then we actually had the people in the workshop do this. And we got into some fascinating conversations where they had perceived the events differently. Uh, and so we had to resolve that. And that was a very, so you find that often. So if you can gather that data up as a starting point separately so that you don't bias each other about your recollection of facts, um, that's kind of step number one that can be helpful. Uh, step number two is then c collecting all of that data. So monitoring is, is huge in the, in the ops space. I think the industry is learning the importance of that or has learned the importance of that. They value that. Gathering all of that data together in a place so that you can uh, then create a timeline. That's kind of step three. And the timeline is going to tell you uh, not only the what happened, uh, but it's going to tell you sort of when it happened. And then you can start correlating uh, different metrics that you see. So somebody did a push, and then this metric went down, and then this metric went up, and, and sort of construct events out of that. And then once you have events, that's when you can actually start doing the analysis. And I think, like I said, a lot of times people just kind of get together and talk about it. And it's not that there's anything bad about that, but a lot of times you, you can miss minor little details that actually turn out to be really useful. Maybe, maybe the, the cause of the outage was we didn't have a monitor on this particular metric, um, but maybe the issue is had you gone through that longer exercise, you might have found maybe there's four other things that are in that same class that you should be monitoring. So that's kind of the difference between you know the whack-a-mole this singular thing, you know, there's a root cause that we tell ourselves caused the outage and we fix that, but there may be these other things in the wings that are of that same class that this longer uh, structured analysis would, would have provide us with some insight into what to address. Right, and there are some tools that you recommend for use in a yeah. post-mortem analysis. Yeah, so it turns out that um, uh, Etsy has written this uh, fun tool called Morgue, uh, where you st store all of your, you know, uh, uh, dead bodies, right? The, the, the site outages, right? Um, and it's this tool that basically actually helps you uh, run a postmortem because it has fields that you can fill in the data that turn out to be very important when you're doing this kind of analysis. Um, it allows you to, uh, you know, submit, uh, you know, uh, images from, gr you know, your graphite servers or your metric servers and put in IRC logs to give time events and stuff like that. And it's interesting as a tool because it not only structures the actual practice of the postmortem, but it gives a place to put that data that's not just the bug tracker. A lot of people just kind of throw this in the bug tracker and maybe it's actionable, maybe it's not. But the nice thing about this tool being separate is that then if you come in and you want to look, how's our organization doing with uh, respect to learning about how we deal with failure and how we analyze failure and how we actually do our postmortems, 
you actually have a store of those that you can kind of go through and either see progressions or regressions or maybe areas that you know you, you had a number of outages and you thought you should look more at and then maybe you find six months later you, you haven't been. Why is that? It's, it's a good store of data for that. Um, there's also some fascinating tools kind of on the ops side. Um, chat ops has become a big thing. This idea that uh, you wire up in maybe IRC or um, Hubot or you know these these chat areas, these bots that actually you tell them to do things and they will go do them. And the fascinating part about that is that's almost like a black box, right? Because it's got the timestamps there. It has who did who told the bot to do whatever. Um, it forces whatever the bot does to be automated because it's not a person typing it. Uh, so that's kind of an interesting uh, uh, development that you see a lot of interest in. The other tool that uh, uh, I recommend is this thing called Teammate. And it's uh, uh, a tool where two people can actually log into a server at once and share the screen. So it very much is the, that uh, War Games uh, scenario, right, where it's like, turn your key, sir, before we do something. Um, but that's kind of the serious context. It allows multiple people to maybe look at what's going on, debug together, uh, and then see what's going on. So it's not uh, one person trying to relay to the rest of the team what they're doing. And that can be really helpful if maybe uh, you want to have one person driving, one owner, but you want to have the team be able to view what, what they're seeing. Because maybe somebody will see something that you didn't when you're actually, you know, maybe your head is in a different space looking at different data on the screen, but something scrolls by and they go, hey, what was that? Right. So that can be very useful for team debugging in the moment. And then, of course, you can use that data again in your postmortem. Right. And so for my last question, postmortems certainly aren't isolated to particular industries. They're, they're widely uh, used across everybody. So how, in, in your research, how are, other industri how are you finding other industries approaching postmortems successfully? And what are some examples that, that you can give? And how can the DevOps community learn from those? Well, so what's interesting about a lot of the research in other industries they talk a lot about this concept of safety um, because it's a nuclear power plant, it's an airplane, it's uh, you know a chemical plant, something like that. And so we're trying to prevent plane crashes or meltdowns or things blowing up. Um, the concept of safety becomes a, an interesting conversation when you apply it to uh, a, a website or a web service. Like, what does safety mean? Um, and then you start getting into, well, is it just the site's up? Is the site's performant? So that's actually a, a, a translation that is somewhat hard to do with other industries because they keep talking about safety, safety. You know, uh, a big area for them, a big area of research for them is like the safety office. Like if you have a safety department at a chemical plant, most, uh, you know, uh, computer, you know, software companies don't have a safety department. I mean, maybe that's QA. So you have an interesting conversation there. And that's actually something I recommend that an organization think about and discuss what safety means for them because that is something in the literature that's not a clear, direct translation. Um, what's interesting about the research that's ongoing is a lot of the gold standard for postmortems is like aviation. So uh, there's a lot, of work, a lot of work been done there. They're very serious about it. How they conduct a postmortem is very sort of established. It's, it, of course, has, has evolved, but it, you know, it's kind of the gold standard. What's interesting, though, is there's a lot of the research actually points back at aviation and says, you know, they used to be very big into root cause. What's the root cause of this accident? And uh, in the research I found, this investigator in Canada actually, uh, the, the aviation board there said, we want to know what the root cause is. He gave them 191 root causes to make the point there is no root cause, right? And so um, I think what you find fascinating is in these other industries, they have this concept of safety. They also have the concept of, of real money on the line that you can measure in extra fuel costs if you don't land and maybe abort a, a landing or something like that, or uh, repair costs for uh, something in a chemical plant that might you know, explode if it wasn't repaired. They have costs that they can sort of measure. So there's a real interesting sort of business discussion that goes on there. That's applicable to our space as well, but that's where it gets really interesting. And that's where you see, you know, a lot of the work that John Alspa is doing, bringing that to, to this uh, industry in this sector. That's where the really interesting conversation is. What does safety mean? And then how do you actually do these uh, time cost trade-offs when it's not, you know, some 
part that you're retrofitting on a pipe that burst or uh, you know fuel that you can actually fill with a spreadsheet and say you know this is how much it actually cost you um, so I think the upshot is is you even though uh, you do see a lot of other industries doing postmortems it may even be mandated by law that they do postmortems it is surprising that they are has still been susceptible to a lot of the things that the research that we're learning and applying directly in our industry uh, they they it applies to them they're on this journey with us. Uh, and so that doesn't make you feel you know, quite like we're totally late to the party. Um, the, everybody's sort of learning um, that, that you know, firing that pilot or firing that maintenance worker uh, because they didn't look at that is not really the way to go and it's not going to uh, solve the next outage or crash or you know, uh, explosion. Right. Well, thank you very much for talking with thank me you. today.